and welcome. I might as well get going. If you guys can hear me okay. This microphone's on. <laughs> so, I think this is our last class. I sort of put where did the semester go here? So, uh, here we are. Good to see you. Um, let me do this and this. Increase the contrast a bit. So, we're going to finish off chapter 11. That shouldn't take too much time. I'm going to go through a few things like beats. Talk a bit about that. There's a pretty simple equation, but can be a bit tricky because it has uh, you know, an absolute value sign in it, basically. I've got some demos for that. I'm going to talk about sound waves and how you can have a standing wave in sound. <laughs> um, somebody asked me on one of these, uh, no, please enter at least one specific question, is how does the small angle approximation work? This is this idea that when theta is measured in radians, then theta approximately equals sine theta. Also, coincidentally, it happens to almost equal tan theta, but not cos theta. But anyway, uh, it helps, uh, particularly when sometimes you have an arc length that is s, or a triangle or something, where this distance is s, and then one side of it is r and r, and there's your theta in here. Then you have that s approximately equals theta times r. And that's kind of the basis for a lot of our equations uh, when s is small. For example, in calculus, uh, you have a little, a little d, d s by dt or something, and it's always small. So you always have the tangential velocity is omega times r, and uh, I guess the tangential acceleration is alpha times r. But I, I went through, as, as I tend to do, and go through the uh, Excel spreadsheet to sort of compare how does the angle in radians compare to the sine of that angle? And they're very, very similar until you only see the first, like the fifth decimal place being different when you get to three degrees. Five degrees is still very similar. At 10 degrees, you're about a half a percent difference between sine theta and uh, theta. And so at that point, if you're putting down three significant figures, maybe you should be a little, start getting a little careful. That's why, that's where the magic number 10 came from is you should probably stay less than 10 degrees if you're going to do simple harmonic motion of a pendulum. Okay. So next thing on the list. Yes, question? Does that mean for like a pendulum, if, it's, if the angle that it, to which the length up goes up to is greater than 10 degrees, it's no longer the harmonic Exactly. If the, if the angle is more than 10 degrees, it's no longer simple harmonic motion. It cannot be described by a cosine of t, 2 pi t over t. There's a much more complicated equation. And sometimes, if you remember, I don't have it here today, but there was a pendulum that had, instead of a string, it had a, a, a low mass rod. So it, can, it could go beyond 90 degrees. Well, you can imagine a pendulum that starts right here. Okay, and then slowly goes. That's definitely not simple harmonic motion. I guess it goes straight up forever, right? And so, um, but yeah, anytime you're beyond 10 degrees, you use something else. It's complex harmonic motion. So beats is periodic variations in the loudness of sound. And uh, I have a demonstration for that. Pius has brought these two tuning forks, and they are both uh, 256, so this is a C note, I think it's middle C. And it's a nice sine wave, so it's a, it's a pure tone. So uh, tuning forks tend to produce a very, uh, what's called a pure tone. Uh, it's not a very musical tone, it doesn't sound like a piano keyboard, a piano note where there's lots of harmonics. This is just sine wave, that's what it sounds like. But if you sound them together, do you hear the up, down, up, down. Somehow they're combining to make a loud sound and then a quiet sound. And it seems to be about every second almost. So what I think is happening is that this one's at 256 and this one's at something different. <laughs> maybe 257, maybe 255. There's about a hertz difference. If I change this one a little more to a different frequency and then hit them together. Now I've made the difference more and so I get a higher frequency beat. So this beat frequency has something to do with the, the difference. And uh, I have a, 
a website that I sometimes go to called Desmos Calculator, where you can type any function you want and do, like, let's say cosine of 2 times pi times x. So there's, there's cosine. I could also do um, cosine of 2 pi and give it a different frequency, like let's times it by 1.1x. So these are two um, waves that have the black line is a slightly different, I guess, frequency than the blue line. And you can see they match up at zero, but then at different, at some point they go out of phase and they go back into phase. So that if you add them, y is cosine of 2 pi x plus cosine of 2 pi times uh, 1.1 x. It's getting a little, but do you see the beats? So let's turn off these ones. But the sum is this. It goes loud, soft, loud, soft. And if you make it not 1.1, but make, make this uh, like 1.2, you get more beats per second. Boom, 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 boom. If you make it, uh, I don't know, 1.05, then it's, it's uh, you know, fewer, whatever, it's lower, fewer beats per second. So the beat frequency gets, um, I guess, longer and longer or, or a lower, lower frequency the closer these are. So it's, a, it's the difference between these two frequencies that really matters. So the math of it, uh, well, the applications is one of those is piano tuning. That's what I'm going to talk about soon is that if you don't have one of those automatic tuners on your, on your phone, you can make a sound which you know is a pure tone like maybe this. I know this is 256 and then play it at the same time as your, your instrument. And if you hear beats, you know they're out of tune. And so you tune it until they are in tune, until the beats go away. And here's the, here's the math. Uh, a beat is a wave that results from the superposition of two waves that have almost the same frequency. That's important. If that's the case, then what you hear is a sound that's actually equal to the average of those two frequencies, but it's, you know, they're both about the same anyway. So you hear one's 256, one's 258, you might hear a 257. But you hear the amplitude going up, down, up, down with this beat frequency, which is equal to the difference, the absolute value of the difference of the two frequencies. And that's uh, from page three, 335 of your book. So it sounds easy, and then I'm going to ask you some learning catalytics questions where you have to really think about this equation and, and try to use it. Um, Let's do the first one. If you combine the sound of two pure tones, one with a frequency of 440 hertz and the other with a frequency of 220 hertz, what do you get? Beats with a frequency of 2 hertz, beats with a frequency of 220 hertz, beats with a frequency of 440 hertz, or a continuous sound which humans perceive to be two tones played at once. Give you a minute to think about that and then click in your answer to share with your neighbor and click in. So five seconds ish. Three, two, one. Okay, good. So, um, so the idea here, and if actually, if you play piano, then this is actually what's called A3, and this is A4, the two A notes. But you play them together, they don't beat. What you hear is you just hear two A notes. And so uh, the, the idea, you just hear them, is that they have to be really close to hear beats. And I guess the other thing I could do is look at that, what happens when I make these, instead of uh, 1.0, whatever I put it as like two. Well, what I get is this. I get the sum of two sine waves that are, so I get, it's not beats really. I guess maybe it's beating, I don't know, maybe really the answer is 220 hertz, but you can't hear 220 beats per second. It's too many. You just hear both notes. Somehow the ear interprets this as being two different frequencies played together. You could do it maybe three. You get different shapes. It's called different shapes of waveforms. So you don't always have a sine wave. You have something that's more complicated. And then it doesn't, it sounds, you, you hear sometimes a harmony. So it was a trick question. Sorry about that. Nope. 
Whoop. Okay. Let's do another one. This is about tuning your piano. So let's say you're tuning your piano and it's an A and you want it to be, it's an A4, you want it to be 440 hertz, but you suspect your piano is out of tune. So you have a reference source which you know definitely is 440 and you play them together and you hear boom, 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 boom. You hear three beats per second, like a three hertz um, beating. So what is that? What's the, the frequency of that piano key that's out of tune? Or you might be out of tune. Give me a minute. Think about that. Share with your neighbor. <laughs> One, twice. Okay, clicked in? Yeah, this was <laughs> another trick question. So, uh, so let, we're going to get to the real question in a second. So, the problem here, you know that F beat is equal to 3. So, it's 3 is the absolute value of F1 I guess minus 440 hertz, okay? So then uh, it means that F1 minus 440 hertz, oops, equals either plus or minus three. That sort of makes sense when you get rid of that absolute value sign? So that's the problem. It could have been, could have been, it's not 440, but it could be this, or it could be this, and I don't know which. Okay, so there's, anyway, uh, so, but there's a way piano tuners can do it, and there's, here's the third question. What you do is you do that first experiment where you get the three beats per second, and then you try um, adjusting the tension in the piano string. So there's a way when you open up your piano to make adjustments to the tension, and so, for example, this piano tuner, after hearing three beats per second, went and cranked up the tension just a little bit. And then you hear the beats going up to seven beats per second. Now what do you think? <laughs> well, let's give a minute to... I said... <laughs> I, I'm worried a little bit that people are overthinking this, but let's just see. So, so to me, my, my thinking here is simply that if you, you know it's off by 3 hertz, so you know at this point that it's either um, at uh, 437 or 443. But then you crank up the frequency and, the, and it gets worse. And I think that as soon as you realize that it's getting worse, you know that you must have started at 443. Because otherwise it would be getting better. So then I think if you end up at 447, is my feeling. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Some people thought this was still a trick question, so... It does occur to me that something else might have happened, I suppose. Maybe it was at 437, and I cranked right through 440 and went all the way back over. And maybe now I'm at, well, I, no, still that didn't work. It would still be at 447 at the end if I got seven beats per second, wouldn't it? There's no way I could be now down below at 433. I don't think that's possible. So maybe it isn't a trick question. <laughs> I think we're good. We're good? Okay. That was all about beats. Last thing is, well, standing waves, and then I'm going to talk about sound. And then I'm going to do some exam review. This is a no-nonsense lecture today. We're just going through, <laughs> trying to prepare you for a final exam. Okay. Yeah, so this is the math of standing waves. Basic idea, and I went through this last time a little bit, is that y as a function of x and t is this old thing, which is just simple harmonic motion, multiplied times the envelope, which is a function of x. And in fact, it's this function of x. So this outer thing, for example, that's happening uh, at that moment of time. That's when 
this simple harmonic motion is at its maximum. So that's, this is just the envelope curve, the uh, A sine X. And conversely, you know, at these points, this point here and this point here, this is when AX equals zero. So you have these nodes, A sub X equals zero at these points. So no matter what's happening in time, they always stay fixed. Um, so that's fine. Uh, that's standing waves. If you have standing waves on a string, though, you always force nodes at the end because the ends of the string uh, can't vibrate up and down. So uh, the nodes happen at some integer times lambda over 2. There's a half wavelength spacing between any two adjacent nodes. So for a string of fixed length L, the boundary conditions are satisfied when the wavelength is some integer multiple of, of uh, or sorry, when the, the length is some integer multiple of, of half a wavelength. So if this is L, 2L is a, is a possible lambda. That would be if you have, um, this is your distance L, and that's half a wavelength. That means that the wavelength is 2 times L. You can also just have L. You can have L over 3, 2L over 3, etc. So, and also, if you know the speed of waves, then you can convert this lambda to a frequency. The frequency is V over lambda, so it's V over 2LM. Two, two it's M, which is an integer, and 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., times V over 2L. So the lowest allowed frequency is when M equals 1. It's just V over 2L. And that's called the fundamental frequency. So there's some, some vocab in here as well. And that's pretty much the basic gist of it. I can give you some graphs and stuff of how it looks. It looks like this. Here's M equals 1. It's called the fundamental mode. Um, I'll just label this as fundamental. Okay, M equals 1. This is what's called uh, the second harmonic. I guess the fundamental is sometimes known as the first harmonic, but most people just call it the fundamental. And then this M equals 3 is called the third harmonic, etc. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But it's M equals 3. So this is what they look like. And what I want you to do next is to try to tell me... Oh, oh there's the first... <laughs> now they're all messed up. Sorry. There's the fourth harmonic. But my words didn't scroll. I want you to tell me what is the mode number uh, M of this standing wave. I think you have to actually type the number in this case. It's not a multiple choice. And going once and going twice. Okay. Uh, so this is called the M equals 5, the fifth harmonic. And the way you find it is you count antinodes. That's the trick. For a wave on a string, or for an open, open tube or a closed closed tube, you count antinodes. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. So to sum up the idea here, the three main things to know about standing waves on a string. Little m is an integer, which is the number of antinodes you see. The fundamental mode is m equals 1. And I guess the wavelength of that standing wave is twice the, the length, the distance between the, the ends, the fixed ends. And then uh, these other frequencies that can be supported in that same string are integer multiples of that fundamental frequency. And they're called the harmonics. Uh, and they form this series. What's interesting is that second harmonic is an octave above that original one, so you can usually uh, on a, you know, excited string to, to have one octave up, but then when you go to three f times the fundamental frequency, it's, it's somewhere between uh, one and two octaves up. It's a, it's a fifth up, I guess, from that. 
different note. And that's it. If you look like this, here's a photograph, a time, uh, a time exposure photograph of the M equals 3 for a, on a, a wave on a string. You see these nodes where nothing's moving. And then at one, two, three, four, five different times, you can see the flash and see it going up and down. And that's it. And one more learning catalytics for you. I'll just give you 30 seconds on this one. Okay. So, stop. So most people got that. So that three times the fundamental, um, I guess F3 is equal to three times F1. Something like that. For M equals three. Okay, so that's it about standing waves in the string. That's all you need to know. You need to know a little bit about sound waves. Basically, that human ears are sensitive to frequencies between about 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. The lower frequencies are the low pitch bass notes, and the higher frequencies are the high pitch treble notes. And so uh, you can have infrasound, like sound waves that are pressure waves that are less than 20 hertz that you cannot hear, but they exist. You can also have, and that's called infrasound. Ultrasound is when frequencies are above 20 kilohertz. Uh, we use ultrasound to image within human bodies. Basically, the, the advantage of using ultrasound is that the wavelength is much smaller, and the resolution of any details that you can resolve with any wave is related to the wavelength. So a smaller wavelength, you can pick out tinier little details, and you can see like a face of your unborn child and stuff. So. But what I wanted to do with this demonstration is um, produce the most annoying sound in the world, and we're going to listen to it. So. The switch is on the back. Ready? Let's turn down the amplitude a little bit. So that's 75 hertz. And I can go down lower than that. Oh, let's turn up the amplitude. That's 50 hertz. Let's see how low can we hear. That's 34 hertz. That's 30. That's 22 hertz. I don't know, what's all the static? 22 hertz. Actually, I can still kind of hear it. That's 18 hertz. Yeah. I don't know. How low can you go? <laughs> Something's going on. I can hear, I'm closer to it, I guess. There's 12, 12 hertz. At some point, it just ends up sounding like tapping. That's 3 hertz. I don't hear anything going on, but anyway. So now it becomes the annoying part of the demonstration. Oops, sorry. 30. Let's crank it up to higher frequencies. Our ears get more sensitive as the frequency goes up. So there's 80 hertz. That's 170, that's as high as this goes. So I have to go to the next range thing. So there's, there's, a, there's a thousand hertz, so one kilohertz. Let's go to two. Oh, again, I've run out of range. That's uh, 1800 hertz, so 1 1.9 kilohertz. Sorry. So it's getting really annoying. That's seven kilohertz. That's eight. Nine. Sorry, ten. Feel free to plug your ears if you want. Eleven kilohertz. Twelve kilohertz. And at thirteen kilohertz, I can't hear a thing. What? I'm not joking. 
Can you guys hear it? I'll turn down the amplitude. Yeah, so, so this is an interesting thing, is that uh, your frequency range is age dependent. So if you're around 20 years old, you can hear, I guess, up to around these 20 kilohertz. If you're 46 years old, then I'm telling you, I can't hear this 13 kilohertz. I can turn it. I'm just trusting you guys. You can hear it? OK. Let's crank it up higher, see how high you can go. Still hear it? That's 15 kilohertz. 16 kilohertz. Can you still hear it? You can't? So that's 16. This is, let's, let's see if anyone can hear the 16. I'm going to turn it off. Yeah. On. Yeah. You can hear it? Yeah. I believe you. <laughs> Want to go a little higher? Here, let's go as high as this thing goes. This is 18 kilohertz. Ready? You can hear that? if we can go any higher than that. It says 20 kilohertz. Let's see if anyone can actually hear 20. This is, uh, let's put it right at 20. We're going to do 20. This is 20 kilohertz. Ready? I don't think anybody can. I sure can't hear it. So. <laughs> but I couldn't hear 13. <laughs> anyway, there you go. I think the eardrum gets more brittle with age and then it doesn't react to the high frequencies. All right, so trucking right along here, uh, there's such a thing as standing sound waves. If you have a long, narrow column of air, such as a flute, uh, it can support a longitudinal standing sound wave. What happens is that the molecules swish around sort of like this. And an open end of a column of air must be a pressure node because it's always at the ambient pressure. It's sort of open to the outside world where there is no sound. So that's kind of zero pressure. And a closed end, it turns out, forces a, what's a pressure uh, node there. Pressure, so pressure antinode because it can push and pull. Anyway, basic idea is that um, you can choose the effective length of a flute by closing or opening the holes. As soon as you open a hole, you're forced a pressure node there, and you can uh, reduce that effective length. But then you get a fundamental note, which is the speed of sound divided by 2L. That's for an open-open uh, tube, like a flute. If you have closed one end, as you would do, for example, with a clarinet, where there's a, um, a reed, which is sort of, it can be closed. Um, then you get a different fundamental frequency because you have a node at one end and an antinode at the other. You can end up with a quarter wavelength there. That gives you V over 4L. Okay. And you can also overblow these instruments sometimes to get another octave up. And so the way it works with all the harmonics is on the next slide. This looks a little scary. But the idea is that uh, the fundamental frequency this is for open, open, F1 is equal to um, V over 2L. This is for a flute. Okay? And all the harmonics are allowed. And the fundamental frequency for a clarinet, F1, is lower. This is why. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed this, but flutes and clarinets have around the same length, but you can play an octave lower with a, with a clarinet because, because of this closed tube. But what's interesting about the clarinet is that only the odd harmonics are allowed. You overblow a clarinet, doesn't go an octave up, it goes more than that. It goes wee and kind of makes a different, uh, uh, different note. Only odd harmonics are allowed because only odd harmonics are going to satisfy the, the requirement that there's a node at one end and an anti-node at the other end. That's it. That's sort of your brass tacks uh, chapter 11 summary. Yes? Can you write it as uh, for the uh, open-closed uh, open 4L? Oops. Because I'm... 
I'm wrong. I'm dead wrong. It's four. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yes? Yeah, yeah I would use these ones. These are, this one and this one are the ones you need to know. That's about it. <coughs> Summed up. And we're not doing this Doppler effect uh, section. Well, we could, but it's not on the final exam, so I'm not going to. Yes? So are those the only examples we need to know? Yeah. This is it. This is it. <laughs> maybe there is and maybe there isn't. Look, let's just, we've got a few minutes. Let's just calmly talk a little bit. Let's go over some review of things that I think are extremely important and that I've had a lot of students asking me about in, um, in office hours. First of all is the difference between angular acceleration, tangential acceleration, and radial acceleration. There's these three types of acceleration and people are really mixed up. And in fact, I even think just ex regular acceleration is a bit of an abstract concept. But let me try to, to sort it out a little bit. So, angular acceleration alpha in radians per second squared just means that something is, whoops, <laughs> is getting faster and faster as time goes on. It starts off with a low angular velocity and is speeding up. That's your alpha. And you have the tangential acceleration is alpha times r. It means that it's speeding up and it's going on a circular path. So those two things are related. Tangential and alpha are the same concept. It means it's not uniform circular motion. Radial acceleration is just good old v squared over r. What that means is that if you're turning and you're on a path that's not straight, then you can always uh, approximate that path as being a circle. Maybe it is a circle, or maybe it's just a circle for a little bit. Here on this part of the road, I could overlay a circle with radius 410 that sort of matches the road there, or uh, you know, maybe 730 meters if I'm there. In all these cases, your radial acceleration is always towards the center of the circle. I guess the component of your acceleration towards the center of the circle is v squared over r. That's the only way to stay on the path. And so it's important because if you're going like, I don't know, 100 meters per second or something, then, and you're on a radius of 75 meters, then your acceleration is 100 squared over 75. Uh, whereas if you're on a 730 meter, your acceleration is 100 squared over 730. So your acceleration is much less on this path, but much higher because you're dividing by a smaller number on this little path. What that means is that you have to accelerate much more if you're going to, this is why you should slow down actually when you're on one of these little off ramps. It's because otherwise you'd require too much acceleration and you'd screech off into the ditch. That's why this R is on the bottom. Okay? Other one that comes up a lot is static friction. No one believes me, but static friction is what makes you go. If you push backwards on the floor, the static friction is what gets you going. Okay? Why is it there? Because on a microscopic scale, everything is rough. And so these stalactites, I guess, mesh up with these stalagmites or whatever, in the, and uh, they kind of lock together. And then, want to want to see a? I think I have an animation. If you increase the normal force, <laughs> they go even closer together, and there's more points of contact somehow, and so you can get a greater maximum static friction force. This hasn't actually changed when you have more normal force, but it can get even bigger if you want it to. But the static friction is just determined by your acceleration, really. On this gravitational potential energy, so we have this equation. If any two masses uh, are within, I guess, this distance r of each other, then they have a gravitational potential energy associated with them, which is negative, and as R increases, it gets less negative, so it gets bigger as you pull them apart from each other. But if you make this approximation, that little R is capital R, some constant, plus Y, where Y is, is much less than R, then we can get this approximation, approximate equation mg times Y, where little g is gmm over R squared. It's 9.8. If you use mass of the Earth for capital M and radius of the Earth for capital R, and you get this MGY equation. Also, which increases as you 
get the things further apart from each other, but now it's getting more positive, I guess. So I'll go over that. <laughs> yeah, this makes me laugh a bit. <laughs> okay, so this, this has got to do with uh, collisions. So in collisions, you conserve momentum. Momentum is mass times velocity. So these two guys are going to have a collision. They're going to uh, conserve momentum. So they're each going to change their velocity, and they're each going to change their momentum. But they change their momentum by the same amount. So if you have a large mass, your velocity changes a little bit. If you have a smaller mass, your velocity changes a lot, and you end up in this pile of people. Anyway. <laughs> but I guess I just put this slide because I wanted to show you that gift. But anyway, it's, uh, the point is that during uh, brief collisions or during brief explosions, the external forces don't have much effect. They don't have much impulse because the delta T is so small. And so all the impulse comes from the collision itself or from what's, you know, their, their bellies, I guess. And then the last review slide is just showing that rotational inertia, this is the big equation to keep in mind, is m times r squared. Oftentimes, there was even a bowling question in Mastering Physics, one of these uh, uh, questions where there was a bowling ball at the end of your arm, and people were trying to apply the two-fifths m r squared for the bowling ball. The idea there is that if, if an object is rotating about its center of mass, then you have to use all those table values of two-fifths or whatever, a hollow sphere or, or all that. But if it's not rotating about its center of mass, like if its rotation axis is here and it's somewhere away, then you just approximate it as being a point particle and you use mr squared. No fractions needed. And that's what they expected you to do with that um, bowling ball. It was swinging back on the end of your arm and you're using the length of your arm as being the, that r. It's the distance of the cent from the center of mass to the rotation axis. Any questions about that? Yes? Did you post like a, an example of the along the On the mastering physics, yeah, I didn't yet. I, I really want to, and I realize it's getting a little late. If, if it's still of use to you, I'll, I'll, I will do it tomorrow, okay? Yeah, I don't have a big list of, of exam review questions. Yes? Maybe you could just repeat that one more time. Which one? Um, the, one the rotational inertia. Yeah, rotational inertia. Yeah, this is a good question. So just to repeat it, the idea is that if something is, I guess, moving on a circular path or rotating about an axis that's not at its center of mass, then you, you can just use mr squared. You can approximate it as being a point particle and just use the distance from the center of mass to the rotation axis as r. Yeah, so there's the, this is it. Be there. Yes? Not really. You can find them. Let, let me, I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. So uh, the exam's three hours. There's 24 hour scratch card questions and two long answer problems where you have to use the four step method from the textbook. So 64 points. This is just about, I do recommend you try to work with people. Go through mastering physics. Go through some end of chapter suggested problems. I'll point, post those things. Uh, some more end of chapter stuff from the, the last few chapters on mastering physics. It's, I find actually one of the best ways to learn something is to try to explain it to somebody else. Because even if you think you understand it, as soon as you try to put it into words or answer someone else's questions, or then you, you realize maybe you don't understand it as well as, as, as you thought. Past exams can be found if you, if you kind of Google on UToronto past exam or something. It's from the library site, and they go through all kinds of past exams. And I think you can get to know kind of what the old system was. They're, they're a little different because they're using different textbooks and things, but I wrote a lot of these, and so you can kind of get an idea of what, where my mind is at. But I wouldn't count on lightning striking twice, but you could try to memorize them, but it very rarely happens. This is the stuff you can bring with you to the exam. An aid sheet, uh, a ruler, a paper copy of an English translation dictionary, a nickel, which you can use for scratching. Don't forget uh, your photo ID and a regular old watch. Do not bring your Apple Watch. This is an important point. It is a big difference between a midterm and a final exam. A midterm is run by me and the physics department. 
A final exam is run by the Faculty of Arts and Science. I do not run it. I am a guest, as you are. We, we all go there and we do our physics together, but it's all supervised and run by the chief, chief presiding officer who comes from the faculty. And these people are no nonsense. If you're wearing an Apple Watch, they'll just snatch away your test and give you a zero on it. It's not good. Or obviously if you look at your phone or something like that, it's bad, okay? Or I don't know what these are, Google Glasses or something like that. Don't do it. <laughs> and all I can do is plead on your behalf, but I can't do anything about it because they're the ones in charge. <laughs> look for low hanging fruit. If, you, if you're on a problem and you're spending way too much time on it and going through tons of scratch paper, I would come back to it at the end. You've got three hours, but the three hours does get used up. It's kind of a long test. Snacks are allowed, okay? I don't think anyone's ever gotten in trouble for taking certain snacks or water bottles or something like that or a banana. I used to bring a banana. And don't forget this, most important thing. And this we learned when we did that whole sleep survey in the midterm. Monday, December 10th, after 10 p.m., you must relax, watch Netflix, go to sleep. <laughs> That's an order. Okay? I don't know if you find the show relaxing because it's really sad and this guy dies, but uh, there might be better shows. Okay? <laughs> Sorry to spoil that for you. <laughs> I was crying so much. Okay. No, but this is serious. I had a friend, um, good buddy Steve, who the night before a final exam, I'd go to his uh, dorm room and it would be 11 p.m. and he'd, he'd be putting on a pot of coffee. And, uh, as, you know, and I'd be like, Steve, what are you doing? I mean, we have to get up tomorrow. <laughs> like, I'm not staying up. I'm going home now, man. Um, so that was me. I, it's, it is popular to you know, pull an all-nighter the night before an exam, but that's probably not a smart idea wouldn't do it. And the thing is, the, the thing to do is you've got to have confidence in yourself. You've been sitting here with me since September and Brian. We've been working through all these mastering physics problems, these learning catalytics, all this stuff. It's got to be in there and you've got to, you've got to allow yourself to, to rely on yourself to remember and to have those skills still the next morning. Be physically ready to focus. And no, there wasn't a moral learning catalytics. <laughs> but thank you for staying anyways. And see you on the final exam. It's been a pleasure.